There we go. Yay. Nice. Very good. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hello, hello. Welcome. <laughs> what happened? Welcome, welcome. We're going to give folks a little bit of time to uh, hop on here, get your coffee or whatever you're drinking this evening. I've got an either or option. Um, right. And we're going to also be live streaming on Facebook here. So give me one second to get that up as well. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome. We'll get started here in just about two minutes. Uh, once we give, uh, uh, it's kind of like back in the old college days, nothing starts on the hour. It's a couple minutes after. On my campus, it was 10 after. The professor <laughs> wasn't there by 12 after. There's going to be nobody in the class. <laughs> <laughs> Good to go. Legend, let's say hi. Say hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so shy. I have to say that's yeah. the best part of Zoom is when like people's kids <laughs> walk <Yeah>. in. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Or spouses <laughs> walk in in their underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the toilet paper? I know, right? <laughs> that's just, funny. Just, My wife has never said that's the best part of her Zoom. Yeah, no. that's well. That's like the 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 you know we're sort of on Zoom sometimes pretending that we're not in a pandemic and <laughs> you know all this stuff isn't happening and you're not like recording yeah. with like your shorts on but then a nice <laughs> like tie and. You know, top, and then suddenly, like the kid comes in, and it's just—it just yes. makes it real. I love it. Right. <laughs> On three, everybody stand up. Right. right. Well, you know, I don't think that's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great, great. Casey, we can go ahead and uh, get kicked off, and uh, I'll, if there's any stragglers that come in right now, I'll go ahead and uh, let them in as you're rocking and rolling. That's excellent. I know that um, Michael from Chaucer's is just waiting to uh, come in. He was, he was here wrong, ago. Yeah. the wrong link. So hopefully he'll join oh, us in just a second. Yeah. Great, great. Super. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Casey Rogers and I'm a volunteer with Coffee with a Black Guy and really happy to have all of you join us tonight. 
Um, we have a big thanks to give to our sponsors for the night. And um, we have really a wonderful group that came together to support this event tonight. I'll just do a quick screen share um, to give them a shout out and um, just say a big thank you to the Red Canary Collective, uh, especially Tracy McCartney and Joe Donnelly who are on the uh, event today, as well as Chaucer's Books, uh, especially Michael who heads up the events at Chaucer's. Uh, Chaucer's is a, you know, Santa Barbara um, anchor organization as well as UC Santa Barbara College of Creative Studies, which uh, one of our authors tonight um, is affiliated with and um, is a professor at um, College of Creative Studies. So big shout out to these organizations who, uh, yeah, put their support behind Coffee with the Black Guy and the author's panel tonight. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Just want to um, say that we are looking forward to to a great event. Um, we do have some polling features that we hope to use tonight, uh, sort of a, an opening question to uh, send out to all of you as well as a closing. We have had some technical difficulties in the, in the past, so um, bear with us if for whatever reason that happens. And um, just really eager to kick this off and uh, turn it over to Joe Donnelly, who will, um, say a few words about Red Canary's support for the event and introduce James Joyce. Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Casey. And um, I see that we're uh, recording and on uh, Facebook, so um, I'm, I'm even more nervous, but I, is it too late to insist on director's cut before this goes anywhere? Or is it, we, is it okay. Well, that, I'll do my best. I have, <laughs> I have papers sprawled out all over in front of me with notes, but I'm gonna do my best to just uh, speak to you guys directly and say, first of all, what a distinct honor and pleasure it is to be here with you all. And again, um, thank you, Casey, for the introduction. And thank you to Chaucer's and um, to UCSB um, uh, Creative Studies. Um, and um, I'm going to attempt to tie together a couple strands. Um, I am here, uh, as Casey mentioned, uh, both uh, representing um, uh, Red Canary Collective, um, for whom I serve as the editor-in-chief of Red Canary Magazine. Um, Red Canary Collective is a, a social change agency that started up uh, right around uh, the same time that um, I was um, incredibly blessed to um, make the acquaintance of a lot of the folks that are here with us tonight, including uh, James Joyce III, Casey, um, Dr. Charlotte Gulp Moore, not Gallup, Gulp Moore, and uh, her um, lovely husband, Jeff Moore, and, uh, um, and uh, we, uh, and Jervy, who uh, um, has joined this group that we started right around a little bit uh, less than a year ago um, uh, that we are calling the Montecito Institute for Social Inquiry. And uh, this is a group that has started um, up uh, in, the, um, in the aftermath of um, the unwanted and un, uh, warranted um, martyrdom of George Floyd. Um, and uh, in um, uh, uh, a, a bookend that I, that I feel like I must mention, um, James Joyce III started Coffee with a Black Guy uh, in the uh, uh, equally uh, terrible year of 2016 uh, in the wake of the um, killings of Alton Sterling and Philandro Castile. Um, so um, we have this sort of um, terrible bookend between and, and you know, Philandro Castile and George Floyd in Minnesota that it really sort of formed the context of why we got this um, group together to try and figure out uh, what we can do to have a voice and to um, uh, do what part we can um, in this um, long overdue and hopefully ongoing uh, time of reckoning. And um, uh, um, our humble effort started with conversations uh, among the group that I, I mentioned uh, before and others, and uh, in uh, trying to think about what can we do to actually um, get these conversations and these ideas that we're discussing out in the world, we realize, oh wait, uh, we have James Joyce III among us, and he has this platform called Coffee with a Black Guy. So uh, in really a no-brainer moment, um, we have sort of have this synchrony and synergy of these different uh, efforts going on. And I am so happy that to be working with um, Tracy and Red Canary Collective doing 
Red Canary Magazine, which is a magazine dedicated to um, uh, social justice and equity. And um, that is how we uh, are all here. Now, um, to uh, get busy with the daunting task of introducing James Joyce III, um, what can I say? Uh, this is, uh, you could think of him in many ways. Um, you know, one way you could think of James is, of course, the black guy in Coffee with a Black Guy. And um, uh, another way you could think of him is uh, the 2018 uh, Distinguished Citizen Award recipient from the uh, Ventura County um, chapter of the NAACP. Um, you could also think of him as the, for the um, nearly 10 years of public service, uh, he uh, put in with uh, uh, Hannah Beth, uh, uh, State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson. Um, uh, and I like to think of him in some ways as a fellow traveler, uh, as, as, a, as a journalist. James is also an award-winning journalist. And I think that um, that uh, method of inquiry uh, and study uh, and objectivity um, uh, has something to do with uh, where he's at today. Although I must say um, he is that um, rare thing, a journalist who grew up and did something good with his life. So um, I, uh, I appreciate that as well. Um, uh, and I wanna thank James for extending coffee uh, with a black guy to both the Montecito Institute of Social Inquiry and to our alliance with uh, Red Canary. And um, without uh, further ado, uh, I wanna turn it over to you and uh, get this wonderful uh, program started with this wonderful panel of uh, vital and vibrant American authors that we have with us tonight. Great. Th thank you so much, Joe. I re really appreciate that coming from the dungeons of your garage. Um, it's been quite a pleasure uh, as we've you know, got, to, got to connect on a weekly basis uh, with, as, as you heard Joe mention about the Montecito uh, Institute for Social Inquiry, uh, getting together on a weekly basis to connect and kind of talk through issues and figure out what we can do uh, to help stand up to, to the moment. Um, and as you see, we are uh, we are engaging in coffee with the black guy. And so as I mentioned, make sure that you either have your, your mug filled with coffee or some other libation to keep the conversation going. Um, that is a very, uh, as, as, as much tongue in cheek that is, that's a very historical and ritualistic aspect of it. Uh, I started coffee with the black guy as an event uh, to sit down, but looking at the history uh, of, of coffee and understanding where it came from and how it originated from the Ethiopia Somali region. Uh, on the great continent of Africa and seeing that back then, in addition to the many myths as to why coffee started being used, uh, uh, the, the, the leaders, the generals, the, the chiefs of, of different tribes would sit down and utilize coffee as a libator, uh, something to kind of vacillate the conversation as they were talking about ways to avoid war or the rules of engagement for war. Uh, and, and I like the, you to, to lean towards the former uh, although we started our year with damn near uh, the latter. Um, and so uh, 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 without further ado, I, I'm so honored to be able to, to open and extend the Coffee with the Black Guy uh, platform to be able to have a conversation this evening about um, how, uh, how authors, how creators are curators of the Black American experience, particularly now, uh, uh, as you, you've heard referenced, this new awakening. And, so we're joined uh, by another uh, fellow member of the Montecito Institute of Social Inquiry, uh, Jervy Turvalon. Uh, he is an uh, author of All the Trouble You Need, Understand This, and the Los Angeles Times bestseller, uh, Dead Above Ground. Uh, Jervy is an award-winning poet, screenwriter, dramatist, and, and was a, a, a born and raised in New Orleans, uh, raised in Los Angeles, and came of age in Santa Barbara. Uh, he did attend UC uh, Santa Barbara at, at a point, uh, received his MFA in creative writing from the University of California, Irvine, and Turbaline is currently on faculty for US, UCSB's College of Creative Studies in writing and literature. Uh, he, as I mentioned, is a proud member of our ad hoc group uh, that was pulled together by none other than Gwen Laurie of the Montecito Journal. Uh, and so, Jervy, great to have you here uh, with us this evening. and looking forward to the gems and jewels you will share. Uh, Gary Phillips uh, is joining us this evening. He's a critically acclaimed author of mysteries and graphic novels. Uh, raised in South Central Los Angeles, Phillips grew up reading comics, classic pulp and detective fiction, uh, and, and the likes of Iceberg Slim, and took inspiration from all of this when he created his first series character, 
Ivan Monk uh, in the early 1990s, a, a private detective of adept at navigating the racial tensions of modern LA uh, and beyond. Uh, Monk has appeared in four novels and one short story collection, Monkology, that was in 2011. Uh, when not writing, uh, Gary is spends his time uh, smoking an occasional cigar and pondering why his poker abilities haven't improved. Uh, and I'm going to have to exploit that at a later date, Gary. So I'm glad to meet your acquaintance. Uh, Phillips continues to live in live in and work in Los Angeles. And on his webpage, he claims 18 novels, nine comics, 50 short stories, and creatively 4,000 plus donuts. Uh, so, Gary, thank you for joining us this evening. <laughs> and last but certainly, certainly not least, uh, I am joined this evening, we are joined this evening from uh, by Nanama Dankwa. She is an author, an editor, freelance journalist, ghostwriter, public speaker, actress, and teacher. I could add some more over the few short weeks I've gotten to know her, but we'll stop there. Her memoir, Willow Weep for Me, a Black Woman's Journey Through Depression has held, was hailed by the Washington Post as a vividly textured, textured flower of a memoir, one of the finest to come along in years. Denkwa, a native of Ghana, earned an MFA degree in creative writing from Benningham or Bennington College. Her writing can be found in Africa Report, The Village Voice, The Los Angeles Times, Allure and Essence. And I'm glad Essence was the last one because it's Miss Denqua's Essence that when we first connected, I, you kind of know when you're in the presence of royalty. Um, and, and I say that and, and, and with all sincerity and, and respect, uh, uh, she has proven every single time. And so it is a great honor and a pleasure uh, to have Nanama Denqua with us this evening as well. So what are we going to talk about? How are we going to facilitate a conversation with all this brain trust on this Zoom call right now? Those of you joining us at Facebook World as well, uh, feel free to go to cwabg.com. You can get the Zoom link if you'd like to interact and engage and ask questions. Feel free to do so and come join us over here. Short of that, the quick parameters that I've laid out for Coffee with a Black Guy, and this is going to be mostly for uh, those joining us because our panelists are all great friends. And of course, they know how to be respectful. They know how to be genuine. They know how to be willing to listen and they will be willing to feel something. So those are some of the, the framing uh, 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 principles at, for our conversation. And the final one is don't seek to dominate with your story. And so give space, share space, make sure everyone has an opportunity uh, to chime in as they feel uh, uh, encouraged to. Uh, and without further ado, when we we had our planning call last week, and I asked a question that created quite some discussion, and I, I think I'm going to utilize that to kind of get into it, because um, Nanama told us at that time that there was, so the question was, what role do, do Black authors play uh, in, in today's America? And the response was, okay, there's a role, but why do we have to define what that role is, right? As creators, why can't creators just create? And I kind of want to utilize that to dive into uh, a, a conversation about, you know, where are you as creators, authors, uh, 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 of, uh, let's say, curators of the African American Black experience? Uh, where is your thinking right now, given the context of where we are as a nation, where our communities are, the divisiveness of our, our, our rhetoric, um, just it, with that context, where is your thinking as a, as a creator? Well, I'll jump in. Um, for me, as I said during our planning session, I, I just, um, I reject this notion that I as an artist have to create addressing anything that's happening right now uh, specifically because I think already you know so much of work that is written by people who are marginalized black people other people of color gay people 
so much of it is thought to be, you know, anthropology and sociology and as opposed to um, just, just creative work. You know, what is the creative imagination? What are you thinking? What are you dreaming? You know, and I, and, and in many ways I resent that. I resent the fact that, you know, white authors can write about, you know, just a dysfunctional family in Idaho or something. Mm. And I have to write about, you know, the riots, the protests, the this, the that. Now, on the flip side, I do think that all artists do represent, as uh, Nina Simone said, they do represent the times in which they live. But I also think that that comes about naturally based on everything that you write. And so there's going to be someone who's going to write about that dysfunctional family in wherever, who's going to be Black or uh, Native American or, you know, uh, Latinx or gay or, you know, whatever, or, you know, transgender. And in that writing will come across our times. But I don't think that to, to force someone to be so myopic about, you know, um, representing who they are in a very specific way, because I'm always representing who I am. I walk through the world as who I am. I see the world through that lens. So everything I write is from the viewpoint of a black African woman raised in America who is living in this, in this time. Great, thank you, thank you. Gary Jerby, any thoughts on that? Well, well, I, I uh, uh, taking off on what Nana said, um, and, and I guess particularly for for me, as we you know we talked about this last time uh, in in our, in our, our prep uh, meeting, uh, being a crime fiction writer, the 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 question came up in the wake of uh, George Floyd's murder last summer, or and there was a round of this in various articles and then in NPR and what have you. Well, how is it, how do you, do you approach how you portray the police, since I write crime fiction and the police invariably show up in some manner, uh, do I, do, do, have I thought about how I portray them any differently? Well, my, my answer for me was, was no, I don't, but my, the, the other part of that answer is I've never really written a novel. I've only written one novel from the point of view or I guess you might call it a police procedural. And even then, all the cops were crooked. So, so for me, it's always been, I mean, I specifically chose, the reason I specifically chose uh, initially to write about a black private eye and specifically to write about the aftermath of the events of 92 in, in, in my first novel, my first published novel, Violent Spring, is because I wanted to have an outsider. I wanted to have an outsider to the police. I wanted to have an outsider to the various other enclaves of the city, et cetera, et cetera. So, so in that regard, it didn't change anything for me in terms of how I think about or how, and also coming out of South Central and also having been a community activist around issues of police abuse uh, as a kind of um, uh, baptism of fire when I was, when I was a teenager. Uh, so, 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 you know, this is in the days of, of the infamous Daryl Gates and and, uh, and his whole militarization of the LAPD and the battle ram, et cetera, et cetera. So, so my perspective on the cops had, all, you know, has always has always been shaded by that, and, and that always carried through into into my books. It certainly is probably different, and, and in fact, I know it's different for um, other black crime writers or other crime writers of color uh, who may have a person of color or may have um, a gay or a lesbian character who is a police person. Right, a, a plainclothes person, usually is a detective, uh, and and how do you portray that person in in a department, whether it's LAPD or some other department? Right. Understanding there's other realities that you that yes, you want to just write a story and you want to tell your story from the point of view of your character and their interactions, etc. But also understanding that there's realities that invariably uh, come to play on how you portray those characters, particularly in those kind of institutions. So, so anyway, so all that to say is that, yeah, I mean, I think those are, it's always, but I think in, in particular then this, this also then spun on the notion of how is it, particularly for, um, for white writers, sort of really getting to that point raised earlier, white writers who could sort of just skate 
to a certain extent, uh, and not all, some, and to show, you know, the tough, hard drinking cop, the divorce cop, whatever, not in touch with his or her feelings. Uh, maybe they're brutal to a certain extent, but their brutality always, you know, services justice in the end or always comes to, or, or we always see in the end why what they did was, you know, was for the better good, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of uh, tired trope certainly came into question and certainly has to be questioned, uh, you know, going forward. Sure, sure. And, and, and that whole notion of the ends justifying the means uh, for, you know, law enforcement has just kind of been the pill that we as a culture have swallowed anyway in mainstream media, artistic, you know, representations and, and the such. Exactly. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Jervy. I see it. Well, uh, my uncle uh, Clifford uh, got offered a job in LA. I think it's probably, uh, he was, I don't know, fairly high up in the New Orleans police force. They probably thought he was a handsome white guy, but he was a handsome black guy <laughs> who was pretty light skinned. And he came out and interviewed and they offered him a job and he turned it down. And the reason he turned it down, he said the graph wasn't as good as in New Orleans. <laughs> So, I don't know. The what? The what, Jervy? I didn't hear. The graph wasn't as good in LA than New Orleans. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Jer Jervy, you did did point out once before you said that the pay wasn't good at law enforcement, but he he was basically like he owned the neighborhood. He owned his entire neighborhood. Yeah. So that like the cynicism, you know, it's just. I, I mean, I think that as a black person, a writer of color, uh, you know, if you're aware enough to be a writer. And observant and you know engaged in the world you'd probably come up with the ideas you know the idea that things aren't what they seem and you know your mind is unhinged anyway i mean to be a writer is to i don't know it's like you hear you hear things in your head and you see things and try to make sense of it and somehow it comes out as a art so art you know comes out as fiction however you want to look at it um i don't know the notion um, uh, yeah, so my idea is that, you know, I, if you, you, you don't speak for people, you speak for your, your experiences within those people. And, you know, for me, uh, as a, you know, I ran to a guy um, today, Jing Wan did a photo spread for Running World. And, um, and the woman that was doing the photos was from the Mert Park where, you know, close to where I grew up. And I got to talking about it. And I said, I'm working on this memoir now and I'm writing about walking barefoot on the jacaranda trees because I was watching Kung Fu too much, you know, TV series, <laughs> always barefoot. And, um, you know, and there was a black uh, bookshop called Hall's Bookshop on Santa Barbara Avenue and all these things that I really loved about growing up in that, uh, that part of LA. Um, and so the more I start thinking about it, the more I start realizing what I really owe to black folks in my writing career and you know, my happiness and, you know, my ability to mature and to be a productive person and to live amongst white people without feeling insane, because, you know, I did have that opportunity to grow up in a, in a black world. Right, right, right. No, and, and, you know, Gary, maybe it's, it's, it's the, your comic influence, but uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm deeply reminded of, of, you know, the, the main motto behind Spider-Man, right? With great power comes great responsibility. Okay. And you know, it, it seems that, to me that that's something that that, that what's that, Jervy? <laughs> no, I was just Jerry. You know, <laughs> that oh, motherfucker oh. comes up often. <laughs> it, no, a, a, absolutely. And 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 we, you know, we understand why we celebrate that, right? We understand, yeah. like, you know, it's easier to celebrate and applaud Stan Stan Lee than it is a, a Gary Bill because of culture, right? And so uh, um, that that whole notion, though, of of you know having the responsibility uh, of being a, an, an artist, a curator of the culture, you know, nonetheless. Um, it it kind of gives an element of being a reflection of the culture, yet still being a part of the culture. And so, you know, it's an interesting, uh, interesting balance that has to be made. And, you know, then I'm, I, I heard what you were saying, and I was kind of wondering a little bit about, okay, so where do you draw your, your, your inspiration to create? Where, where does that come from? And, and you know, I guess, you know, how, how does that manifest into your, your, your final piece of work? Well, I'm a nonfiction writer primarily. And so I guess narcissism, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, um, in, in all serious, in yeah, all Mike, seriousness, yeah. no, no truth. <laughs> in all seriousness, I um, I think the truth is stranger than fiction, and I like to see how stories come full circle. And I find that our lives are fascinatingly symmetrical in a way that we don't even realize until we start sort of investigating it. The person who, you know, you went to school with and, and you know, for 10, 12 years ends up being the person who you move away 3,000 miles and then you fall in love with and get married to. Or, the you know, I, I, I love seeing the way that our lives kind of come full circle. And I also know that as a writer, writers, um, writers understand that stories are not linear. You know, stories are anything but linear. Stories kind of go in, in, um, in circles or, you know, if you look at a whole community, it's fractals. You know, it's like, it's, which, you know, fractals are what everything is based on, right? Um, <laughs> but, um, so I guess for me, um, it just happens, it, it's just, it's just what happens in my life, you know, just the strangest things that, that take place. And I see the story in that. And then I'm really sort of very fascinated by the hows and the whys. And um, I'll give you an example. I was... Um, I was driving, I went, to, I went to Vegas with a friend, you know, probably the only friend at the time that I had where I live in Coachella Valley. I had just moved down to Coachella Valley and I met some guy in um, the mailbox where I'd go get my mail, the private mail service. And I said, hi, I don't know anyone here. <laughs> you know, will you be my friend? <laughs> <laughs> so and so he was like um okay and we, and we exchanged numbers and um so we ended up like you know fast forward like however many months we ended up um and he just a friend completely platonic we ended up driving up to Vegas to see another friend of mine who was performing um mm -hmm. in Vegas so you know we had a great time and then we were like driving back and we're on the freeway and there's a sign that says that there's been an accident. And so it's actually, it's asking us to reroute onto the surface roads. And I said, well, you know, I don't really like taking surface roads cause you know, black folks understand that you can end up anywhere. And I just kind of want to take the freeway, <laughs> you know? And he was like, no, 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 it's really cool. You know, it's, this is a nice area. And I was like, well, okay, I'll just take some of your white male privilege today. <laughs> I will go. Either we'll be fine or we're going to be dead because they're going to look at you and be like, what are you doing with her? <laughs> so um, we were driving and um, there was um, this amazing, incredible, incredible Joshua tree forest. We were driving through oh. the Mojave National Preserve. And it was just this incredible Joshua tree forest. And I was like, wow, this is so magnificent. And in that moment, I thought, see, this is what happens when you're not allowed to go the back roads, right? When you're too scared to be like a black woman on your own driving and just seeing nature and just being engaged. And so I said, you know, I really want to take a photo. And he said, okay, well, let's pull over and we'll just take a photo. So I pull over. Trifling as I am, I'm not willing to get out of the car. I just want to roll my window down, take my cell phone and snap a photo. He, on the other hand, gets out of the car. He's in the passenger side. He gets out of the car and he's just in the back of my car when I roll my window down. It's all a matter of seconds. I roll my window down and I go, huh, what's that smoke? And he goes, huh? And I said, what's that smoke? And then suddenly he goes, get out of the car <laughs> you know, the car is like on fire right <laughs> so the car is on fire I opened the door and there's this like because I had a retractable step and it open it comes out and there's like a tray of flames and so I had to jump out of the flames and we're just like running right 
And it was this, you know, so I've been writing about that because it was just this, there's this, there's this weird sort of um, reality of I pull over because something was so beautiful and magnificent and then I burned the whole thing down. <laughs> like I literally burned down a significant part of the forest. Mm -hmm. They had like airplanes, like dropping stuff. And I was like on my knees on the street going, oh no, what have I done? And so it's just like, you know, it's just the stuff that happens to you where you think, well, this is, this, this is nothing but metaphor. And even as I was living it, I was like, there was a part of me that was in complete trauma. And there was a part of me that was talking to the park rangers going, so where'd you go to school? Writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> you know? There was a journalist in me, but um, that's where I draw my inspiration. And, um, you know, so for me, it was, and by the way, my car did burn because of climate change. It was so dry. Mm -hmm. There had been no rain. And I learned, as I had never understood before, that your catalytic converter mm -hmm. gets so hot, mm -hmm. so, so hot. And when it makes contact with the dry brush and there was just enough wind, poof, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it could have happened to anybody. There was nothing wrong with the vehicle. And it took 10 seconds for it to happen. So there's something that's there. And it's this story that, like, you want to share with here. You, you want to share it with everybody where it's like you're stuck where there's no cell phone. You know what I mean? And anyway, that's where I get my inspiration for stories. It's life. I find it fascinating because I think the truth is always stranger than fiction. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 you can't help but write about that. Right. I mean, just the, the image that you created just verbally, uh, you know, I can only imagine what, what you're going to do with that to dive into it, you know, on the, in the written form. So, um, wow. Journey, how about you? I would just, I think at this point, it's probably important to point out that real writers are not like normal people, that the things that we, we enjoy that amuse us, uh, you know, probably aren't that acceptable. I mean, we kind of fake it, but like uh, my wife likes to work. Um, I like to do things, but I don't necessarily like to work. I mean, I like to make <laughs> things right. I like to, I don't care about the corporation. I care about like, I don't know, hey, maybe Gary wants to get a beer. I mean, I, I just, you know, one time Gary and I ended up, we did this book called The Cocaine Chronicles. And we ended up in New York. And uh, first of all, I don't know what the hell we were thinking. Um, because we couldn't figure out where we were supposed to be interviewed. And at some point we thought it was in a cemetery because we right. were drinking. And we were thinking, do we have to hop the fence to find where in the cemetery? <laughs> so we finally get into the build. We realized we were actually in a very, in a building. And there was a strange guy who was, uh, had a nationwide um, uh, program, uh, I guess midnight or something like that. Right. And, you know, Gary and I, I don't need them, let's do cocaine. And the book was called The Cocaine Chronicles because we're amused by cocaine stories. And right on the air, he asked us, how did we get in the coke business? You know, how's the business? And we're like, "You're no, we're not coke dealers, man. We're, just, we're writers. We didn't do any coke. Gary had a few whiskeys that were free at the reception. <laughs> So those are things you live for that, you know, you, That's it. you know, our minds don't function. Sometimes it ends up being for the greater good. And, uh, you know, you realize that you got to, you know, kind of make sense of what we, uh, what we're dealing with years ago uh, after, you know, the, the 92 rebellion, it's a 92 or 94, it was 92, right? 92. Yeah. You know, it's like, why do you want to forget that? You want people, particularly writers to like commemorate the event and make it last. And so we did this big book called The Cocaine, um, uh, Geography, Geography of Rage. Yeah. yeah. So everybody just told their different story, you know, about what they was. And Gary's story was great. Um, what did you do, Gary, when the city was burning around you? Where were you at? Uh, like any bourgeois homeowner, I, I stayed home to protect, to protect the pad. The, the, the wife and kids left. And then I, I just stayed there, well, drinking whiskey and, and uh, with a revolver, which is always a great combination. Yeah, that's always good. Yeah. 
Did you have oh, a but, fever though? You had a huh? fever. You had a fever and a gun. No, I had a whiskey fever, but I didn't have no fever fever. <laughs> <laughs> you did have the gun though, right? I had the gun. Yes, I had the gun. Okay. So I mean, that, I guess that's at the crux of what hap- what art is, right? You take uh, what's what's that old Rob Bass song, jo- "Joy and Pain," uh, you know, right? It's it's the the well, damn, it's the yin and the yang that I'm always talking about through race and and through all of yeah. the, the conversations, right? There's nothing in life without the positive and negative. In order to get this beautiful piece of art that you all are able to create, you know, you may have to go through a story about you know people thinking that you're a cocaine dealer. Uh, and and like the, the the reflection of what that feels like and how like that's a thing and and that's worthy of 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 um, documenting and and sharing. I think. You know, you well, might want to um, ask Nama Na- Na- how how does she know everyone in the world? She is the most well connected human being. I've ever known. <laughs> well, <laughs> she invites you to a party. You go, my God, who's here? I mean, you know. <laughs> so, so part of being a, a a writer is is having an interesting life, huh? She has Neil Young at her parties. She has like, uh, that's impressive. Uh, yeah, I I I I do not know Neil Young. He was not at my party. It was Jackson Brown. Oh, so oh, all right. oh, all right. <laughs> oh, okay. That, oh, that's, oh, that's different. That's different. That's, I don't know that's Neil Young. That's different. It's, okay, that's the other white guy. Yeah, that's right. That's it. That's right. Well, uh, well, talk to us a little bit about that about about your history. I mean, uh, you, you know, you live part time in the United States uh, pre COVID and and part time uh, in Ghana, correct? Yes, I did. Um, I was living part time, you know, doing doing half and half. I was born in Ghana um, and raised primarily in the United States from the age of six. And as an adult, just um, went back and forth. And I grew up in a very sort of um, Typical in one way. I mean, immigrant households are kind of split. There are some that are typical in the sense that, you know, you fully assimilate. And then there's some that are typical in the sense that they, you don't assimilate. They don't want you to assimilate. And mine was that way where it was like, once I stepped across the threshold of my front door, America ceased to exist. You know, we didn't speak English. We didn't eat American food. And I remember growing up and the only thing that I wanted in life was a school meal because I just love the little partitions and I love <laughs> how, you know, I love the little partitions on the little plates and they gave you this cute little milk and, and I just wanted to have that so bad. And I go to my friend's houses and they would open the refrigerator and there's like all of this like, you know, cold mist would come out and then there'd be like that s from the swanson's frozen foods and i would beg my mother can't we just buy a salisbury steak and she's like no (laughs) (laughs) but um so that's how i grew up i grew up um i grew up sort of with a foot in both worlds and um then as an adult i moved back to back to ghana Um, and you know, I have to say, which is a story for a different time that for, you know, my parents kind of got a divorce at a certain age. And at the time, I I think everybody who's a child of divorce understands that something slips through the cracks with parenting during that sort of tussle. And for me, what slipped through the cracks was that neither one did my paperwork. So I ended up being illegal, even though both my parents were legal and we came here legally. So I was illegal, illegal, illegal until finally I naturalized. Having been here since the age of six, the first president I ever voted for was Barack Obama. I had just become a citizen. So anyway, um, I moved back to Ghana and I taught at the university and, you know, lived there. It was a really easy transition for me because I had had that, you know, step over the threshold. You're in Ghana in my home. So I still spoke all the languages, cooked the foods, ate the foods. And I, you know, my family is a political family in Ghana. Um, It's an old political family. My grandfather is considered the doyen of Ghana politics. 
And so I moved back and I did some political work up until 2016. I was the international speechwriter for the president of Ghana. And um, now I'm just, I'm just here trying to not get COVID like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer your question, Jeremy? <laughs> yeah, it, it touches on it, yeah. <laughs> Tangentially, yeah. Thank you, Jervy. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Gary, I, I'm curious. I, I want to circle back to that question about where where you get your your inspiration to to create. Um, well, I think you know you you, you really put it out there, James. I, I think all this stuff is just, you know, to Jervy's point, it's just all stuff crowding my head. But you know, it's from my childhood of watching, you know. Uh, you know the original uh, 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 reruns of the twi uh, the original Twilight Zone reruns and 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 uh, reading Marvel comics because you know you know growing up in South Central you in those days you didn't read you know a DC comic because that was like for sissies you get you get hurt if you read a, you know Spider uh, Superman or Batman because those are too silly in those days you know you read you had to read uh, you know Fantastic Four which by the way which by the way is the first that Fantastic Four issue 52 is for the first appearance of the Black Panther for, you know, those keeping the score. Yep. So, 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 uh, and then, you know, and my mom was a librarian, right? So that, so that didn't, that, that didn't hurt in the sense of like, you know, I had to read, you know, the classics I read, you know, Native Son, et cetera. And then, but in those days, um, you know, you go down to, uh, the thrifties drugstore and, uh, on the spinner rack, would be these books from you know the infamous Holloway House, right? Which was the the white publisher in town, but they they published the quote unquote the black experience. But in particular, of course, they published they published several black writers. But in but particular, they published uh, uh, Robert Beck, aka Iceberg Slim, and and Donald Goins, uh, as well as Joe Nazel and uh, Jerry's and I friend uh, uh, Emery Holmes uh, was an editor there. Uh, Wanda Coleman was an editor, yeah. yeah. And but those are those those were like the those would be considered now sort of these uh, you know gangster uh, crime novels, but they weren't really called that then. But they really were. They really. They, but they were from the point of view. They weren't from the point of view of law enforcement. They were from the point of view of uh, the antihero, right? And and you didn't find Hollow. Like I said, you, you, Holloway House in those days, you didn't buy them in a bookstore. You actually bought them on spinner racks, and you bought them at at the at the bus depot because that's that's who that's where their market was that's who they knew who their market was and you bought them at liquor store and uh, and they were all paperback originals Odie Hawkins who's still around was a writer there they, and, they put out players too though right and they put out players magazine yeah that sort of black playboy but that's a little later but and so I, re I would read those books too right and 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 you know I was playing football in high school and so forth and so forth but so all that stuff right all that stuff and then also being a community organizer all that stuff was in a is a kind of a mix and so then i knew uh once uh the events of 92 happened and i'm already in my 30s at that point and once the events of 92 happened and you know and I, and knowing at least some of the folks involved in the gang crew stuff and knowing some of the folks uh uh, uh connie rice and uh, and some of the other folks who were involved in uh, what became uh, rebuild la um, so kind of knowing all these different players, right? Folks on the streets and folks in the suites. I thought, well, okay, this is a, and, and also at that point I was a, a community outreach director for Liberty Hill Foundation, which is still around, which funds uh, community organizing. And, and kind of knowing that territory and knowing these people, I thought I could take that stuff. I could, I could, I could pull from that experience and create uh, a mystery novel, but a mystery novel that to me would have a different kind of edge then, then not, 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 at that point, you know, uh, uh, Walter Mosley's been published. My my buddy Gar Haywood's been published. So the kind of like third wave of black crime writers were already starting to come on the scene. But I thought within that, I could sort of carve out my niche. So sort of this social political kinds of mystery novel it would still be entertaining. I hopefully right, and would hopefully you know still have these kind of interesting uh, hard boiled characters. But in the context of that, it would also then look at, in particular, like that first novel, will look at the city a year, year and a half out uh, from, from 92 as the city tried to heal, as things are still precarious between Blacks and Koreans, et cetera. And, and what, would it, what would it be like if I had 
so you know the novel starts with my characters at a groundbreaking ceremony at the at the flashpoint right at normandy at, at florence and normandy and in the novel his his old high school girlfriend who is now the city council person for that area uh has invited him and there's a you know groundbreaking ceremony right symbolizing new hope and rebuilding and but as the as they're you know unearthing a little bit of earth to for the cameras uh when the bulldozer backs up there's the body of uh what turns out to be the body of a korean merchant who disappeared two weeks before uh the civil unrest uh kicked off so this guy's been missing about a year and a half and then so for pr reasons like the korean grocers association hires a black private eye to try to find out what happened to bong Su kim and that you know kicks off the the, the plot but it, but it was also a way then to look at these various territories to look at these various uh, enclaves uh, of the city and to look at what was the efforts at both, you know, high and low efforts in terms of trying to rebuild it. So that was easy. So, so the, 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 the long answer to the, the, to the, the short answer to the long, to the, my long answer is that that was easy to write about because I knew that. Right. But then it's, you know, as you get further down the line and start to diversify and create different things, it's always about, it's not always about, it's, you know, I'm kind of a news junkie. So I listen to the news a lot. But then I'm always very interested in just just odd and quirky, as I think as everybody said, you know, just odd and quirky characters are, are the thing that drive, I think, that make these books interesting, right? You know, there's only so many plots to go around, but it's really about the weird people that you can, that you can set in motion and what motivates them, what do they want versus what does another main character want? Because I also write books about criminals, right? I, I write books, I mean, because of those, reading those books by Goins and Beck uh, and others. Uh, I, you know, I write books about bad guys doing bad things. And, and, and so again, um, I don't want to be, I think to the point, I don't want to be, uh, anchored because I'm writing about a black character. So therefore I quote unquote have to uplift the race. I'm probably <laughs> bringing the race down, but, but I hope, hopefully I'm also saying something. I'm also giving you some kind of insight uh in into at least what is driving that particular character it, 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 indeed and I, I i you know hearing you explain that and, and knowing what time frame you're talking about i question how much it has, has really changed because it sounds like we're we're in a very similar dynamic in society in society now and um you know I've, I've often thought of this concept of a continuum of better racial understanding and i don't think you're bringing it down bringing down the black experience or the black race gary i think it's a it, you're at a point in the continuum where folks who who want to enter there can enter yeah, there, yeah. and then they can go to where they need to go. But 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 that's a you know folks would be interested in that, and that might attract folks in too. And so uh, you know what you're doing is you're creating an entry point along that continuum uh, for folks to, to whether you know it or not. And that, and I know that's not the intent or, mm -hmm. or the goal, yeah. Uh, yeah. but we call those unintended consequences indeed sometimes. I, I see that uh, uh, we're, we're closing in on the hour here. And so I want to be respectful of oh, folks' wow. time. But uh, uh, yeah, exactly. That, that happens so quickly. Um, but but um, definitely want to continue the, the, the conversation here. So I think we're going to check in on a few uh, housekeeping items and then uh, uh, keep the conversation going for some of those that, that, that yeah. want to stick around. Uh, as long as Nanama doesn't have a party plan to go attend right now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. We're picking on Nanama, huh? That's right. Uh -huh. That's it. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's, uh, that's how that worked out. That's right. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the party girl. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, cool, cool. Well, no, I, I do see that we, we do have uh, one of our... Uh, sponsors here, uh, Michael with uh, Chaucer's Bookstore. So I want to definitely give Michael a, a few moments to uh, uh, be able to, to, to share good. some thoughts and also let you know about some of the uh, other events that we, we have coming up. Uh, uh, and because we definitely want to support our hometown bookstore um, throughout COVID. I, I know that, that they stayed open uh, uh, at, at, in some capacity throughout COVID. I even recall that the, Michael sharing that they had a a delivery service for books, right? And so, you know, when you mm -hmm. think about adapting and pivoting and 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 really standing up to the time, uh, you know, a local bookstore really, you know, that's a, that's an untypical story that you're going to hear. They stand up to the time by delivering books uh, to your doorstep. Uh, 
Uh, uh, so uh, without further ado, Michael with Chaucer's, if you'd like to, right, hopefully you've been unmuted there and can, can share yeah. a few words here. So. Well, uh, James, thanks for the shout out, especially about the delivery, because I'm also the delivery driver. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Events guy, delivery driver. Uh, before I begin, a shout out to Brian there for your sign behind you, your banner behind you. It's pretty amazing stuff. So thank you for the support. Um, I've got my Asians with attitude behind me supporting. I'm going through some stuff here, but we're fighting through it. Uh, Chaucer's really proud to support Black literary voices, not just the Colson White Hoods or the Toni Morrisons, but those who are striving to create in their own way, like the Gar Anthony Haywoods, the Garys, the Nanas, the Jervies. And, you know, if I have to add that Jervy has given back to his literary community tenfold from what he's received. Kudos to you, even though you ripped part one of my pieces a few years ago, but who's going <laughs> to... It was well-deserved, thank you. But we're really pleased to be part of this and thank you to James, to Casey, as well as our fellow sponsors, the Red Canary Collective and the UCSB College of Creative Studies. Uh, please check us out, chostersbooks.com. Uh, Sunday, we have an event with a penguin. And then Monday is a volcanologist, go figure. But on the sixth, we have a really important one with uh, Dr. Sara Kamali, whose book Homegrown Hate is coming out on that day. And our co-host will be none other than James Joyce III, who will be the moderator. So we're very happy. It's April 6th at 6 o'clock p.m. And again, James, keep up the great work. We're just really proud to be a part of this. So thank you and thank you, everyone. Very good. Th thank you uh, so much for that, Michael. And, and just a, a little extra extension on, on Dr. Kamali. Cut several years back uh, after I had an article uh, about Coffee with a Black Eye platform in the Santa Barbara Independent, I think it was, uh, she had reached out as, as teaching a class up at SBCC, uh, invited me in to talk with her, her students, and we've maintained contact and a relationship over the years. Uh, and so she's just wrapping up, uh, just published this this book and will be you know, having her, her published date. And so happy to help support support that and see the evolution of the conversation right you know these kind of conversations don't always have to be about the 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 struggle the pain we can talk about the creative side we can talk about the artistic endeavors uh, because that is part of it that is part of the american experience uh, and 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 more specifically the black american experience right um, and and nanama you pointed pointed that out so acutely in 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 our meeting and helped thread that through in our conversation today that we we really shouldn't have to be defined by this, right? We are American. We are just ex sharing our experiences. And, and when you think about, you know, that whole statement of, a, of the Black American experience, is it a one a one uh, one lane experience? Absolutely not. You know, we're not a monolith. And, and, and you, you, you see that by the artwork created by just the three authors that we have on the panel with us today. Um, and so you multiply that with all the friends that they have. Uh, and, and all the creators that they know. And, and that is part of what helps make up our fabric. Uh, that's what, what I would encourage folks to just dive into and lean into, you know, as we've been going through this, this uh, new racial awakening uh, in, in our country for many folks. Uh, the question is, what do we do now? How, how, you know, where do we go from here? And I think, you know, consuming uh, uh, the land, uh, consuming the fruits of the pain, consuming the fruits of the joy, consuming the fruits of the experience uh, 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 is part of it, right? And, and part of that understanding and creating those bridges. And, and uh, uh, when you can find the parallels between, you know, the Black American experience in your life, no matter what that is, uh, that, that is that, that's bridging the empathy gap, right? And, and I think that's, that is a, a, a progressive step forward uh, and, a, and a step in the, in the way uh, that we should continue to go. Any other thoughts here uh, uh, to 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 the authors uh, who you know? I, I mean, one of my curiosities at this point is listening to this conversation. I mean, is anybody working on something now that you'd like to share with us that 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 is kind of you know whatever it is? You know, where did that inspiration for for your current work come from? Can I just actually before we um, may I before we get into 
Absolutely. What, what we're working on. I, I'd love to talk about, you know, there's, there's, there's two parts to being able to hold a book and say, I wrote this book. There's the part where you are in your house working and or coffee shop or wherever. And that's where you talk about what is the inspiration and what was your, what was your, um, what was your craft like? What was, you know, what was your uh, way of doing this, putting this on the page? Then the other side is the publishing, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. I think that many of us um, as black writers have come up against the gatekeepers and many people have, you know, come to understand that so much of our work as Black people is held back by certain gatekeepers who don't understand and think that there's no readership and think that there's, you know, wonder like, oh, well, if you make this character more sympathetic, well, no, that's not what this character is, you know? And so they shape so much. And I think that so little of um, gatherings like this focus on it. Now, something really interesting happened um, during COVID was on Twitter, there was a really interesting discussion called Publishing Paid Me, mm. where white writers mm -hmm. suddenly started saying, publishing paid me $100,000. Mm. And it was a white writer you never, ever heard of, right? Mm -hmm. Mm. And then black writers were saying, and these are black writers that are well-reviewed, award-winning, publishing paid me. So the white writer will say, publishing paid me $150,000 for my first book. The black writer says, publishing paid me 15,000. Mm. You know, like Roxane Gay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She got like, you know, 15, 25, 30,000, something like that for her bad feminist book, which, you know, sold and sold and sold and sold and it's continuing to mm -hmm. sell. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't an unknown person at the time that she sold the book, but yet an unknown white writer will get $150,000, $100,000. And um, I think that that discussion was really important that publishing uh, needed to start having. And then also, the gatekeeping that's mm -hmm. been happening. And so now bringing more people of color into publishing because we're sitting here talking about black voices. And I think that, you know, certainly this is important. And certainly we think of ourselves as marginalized people, but, you know, I can't even stop to think about Native American voices, mm -hmm. you know, other voices that don't have nearly as much representation as we have. And so the fact that, you've got some guy who doesn't understand, um, you know, what's going on. And I just want to give one example and then I'm going to just mute myself and turn over the conversation. My one example is I worked as a ghostwriter and I was ghostwriting a book for a politician in Ghana and the U S publisher, when we turned in the manuscript, specifically the notes that we got back, were so just off, mm. you know, talking about, we, were, we, we wrote about him growing up and the, the compound that he lived in and how they used to gather in the evenings in the courtyard and the women would cook and they would pound fufu and they would, you know, like cook over the open fire. And this editor wrote as a note, well, where was the kitchen? <laughs> was there a refrigerator? And this was like in the 90s. <laughs> this was like, and it, this was like a village, a small mm. village. And just contextually, I thought, huh. Mm. And so the politician that I was working with went through the comments with me and said, you know what? I can't do this. Mm. I just, I can't do this. And he said, call her, buy her a ticket, fly her over here. I'm not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what we did. Yeah. I called her and I said, he would like for you to come. Mm. And so when she came, I'm riding in the back of the vehicle with her. And she said, wow, this is all so normal. <laughs> and I just sort of reached over to her and I leaned over 
And I said, girl, we done took the bones out of our noses for you. <laughs> I was like, you know, yeah. But this is the person, no, but this is the person, and this is where it, it's, this is where it's problematic. This is the person who manuscripts come across her desk right. and she decides who is able to read this because right. everybody who is in these little squares here would probably have been able to read this book because right. you clearly have the interest. That's why you're here. But this woman has, you know, she didn't right. understand. And the whole time she was there, she kept really, I mean, I don't know what she thought we would be doing with mm -hmm. bows and arrows or something, or, you know, I don't know. And mm -hmm. this is, this is a higher up. You know, this is a yeah. very, yeah. Yeah. you know, she has a huge title at this publishing house and she's come to Ghana. You're not even in like some small, teeny, insignificant little country. Ghana is a pretty, you know, yeah. most other Africans will say, hey, Ghana's like the Paris, of, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You know they, they're pretty like, you know, industrialized and stuff, you know, pretty up there. And so you're not even in a country where there's real issues, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so and so. That's what we need to talk about, I think. Yeah. Well, and, and and that that is is like what that the terminology that you hear that folks mention that like that that's cultural competency, right? And that shows a, a, a lack of cultural competency of people who are gatekeepers and and right. understanding that that there's gatekeepers of of, of every industry, uh, every educational institution. I mean, there there's gatekeepers in in, in everything. Um, and you know, as a journalist, you were told to. To, to make friends with gatekeepers, right? Because that allows you to, 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 to get access to the information that you need to actually write that story or to mm -hmm. share that story. And so, you know, I, I think that's a, a helpful reminder to, you know, in, in, encourage us as we embark upon this, this work as community to make sure that, that we keep in mind that we're, 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 we're uh, cajoling our, our, our gatekeepers that are in our communities. The gatekeepers. Well, what's the damage people. that's done by cajoling? What's the damage that's done by when people just don't have that vision, don't have the ability to see you in your in, in your complete self? You know, what is that? What is the damage that is done? Because there's a part of you, and W. E. B. Du Bois wrote about that sort of double consciousness. You know, the two-ness. And what is the damage that is done? And what are the stories that we're not hearing? Because, you know, what are the stories that are not coming out? And one of the examples that I gave in the prep was when you're, when you're in Ghana and you look at the artists that are, they're selling, you know, visual art to tourists who are wanting to buy street art, visual art, mm -hmm. and they're getting pictures of Afro pics. They're getting pictures of like, you know, these carved figurines. They're getting all of these kind of very Africa, you know, you know, this sort of like a, 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 a stereotypical African scene with the sunset, the little sort of, you know, mm -hmm tree that is I mean a very even if you're in Ghana you get a very East African scene right so then you go into real artist galleries and you're seeing art that will rival anything you will see anywhere else in the world but there isn't that interest because in the gatekeeper's eyes so when you cajole these gatekeepers when you make friends with the gatekeepers there's a part of you that is sacrificed and that is for me where the issue where the issue and where the conversation is is what am i leaving behind to come to this table with you right you, 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 several years ago uh, me and a uh, this other buddy of mine chris chambers we we edited an anthology called the darker mask we did it for tour and tour is a pretty large imprint it was a sci-fi publisher but it's part of uh is part of uh, St. Martin's is also part then, which is in turn part of, I don't know, I can't remember, is it Bertelsmann or, or Hachette? It's one of those big, you know, but it's, you know, it's large. And we got a fairly, we got a pretty good advance. We actually were, pay, you know, for, for short stories, we were able to pay the writers pretty well. And we had a very interesting cross-section of writers, Naomi Hirohara, uh, who lives there in Pasadena, uh, uh, Steve, Bar Steve Barnes and Tanana Reeve Dew did a story. And we had a very interesting cross section, but but the idea being that these were all sort of people of color or marginalized folks writing superhero stories, with obviously superhero stories with a much different slant. I might I might tell you this was before the success of Black Panthers, before 
um, uh, the revamp, Twilight Zone, et cetera, et cetera. So some of the, so we were, to a certain extent, we were, I like to think we were a little ahead of our time. So the long story short is that one of the writers, actually it was Steve Barnes, one of the, so he's at this convention, yeah, you know, sci-fi convention. And he runs into this editor who's, a, who's the editor uh, of a large, uh, uh, you know, there's a couple of big uh, or, or well-known uh, uh, sci-fi magazines, uh, digest magazines, and they publish short stories and they also do reviews. And he asked him about, was he gonna, you know, cause they, they, had, they we knew that the galleys had gone to this, to this, uh, to this magazine. And this guy's the, you know, he's the head guy, he's the, pub, he's the head editor and publisher. And he was just asked, you know, what were you considering a review? And the guy, and the guy essentially told, well, you know, you know, black people don't read science fiction. No, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, but there you have it, right? I mean, it's just like, wow, really? I mean, we got a whole bunch of black folks, we got a whole bunch of other folks writing this stuff. That, you know, there's a whole black nerd culture, but never mind that. But you know, but but that was his attitude, right? I'm not going to review it because it's a it's you got too many black folks writing it, so therefore it's a black book and it's a, all these black sci-fi and weird and superhero characters. No, because white white people won't read that, right? My audience, my audience for my digest mag, you know, this magazine won't read that. But it's like, but how, yeah, that, that that was his mindset, and he'd been, you know, he's considered a very venerable, knowledgeable, you know, erudite, all that, all that jive. Uh, you know, uh, but yet here he was, this 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 great stumbling block to to you know reaching possibly reaching another uh, audience because his point of view was well you know what's the sense of this this thing is this this is an outlier what's the sense of you know even you know acknowledging this book exists. But let me ask you a question, Gary. How often do we have to keep proving ourselves? You look back to roots. Yeah. Um, in 1977, you look back to Roots when it first aired in January 1977, and you see that it broke so many records. It was mm -hmm. the most watched television show, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you're now having to prove yourself again just to get a Black Panther. Right. You know, you're right. having to prove that you have got this this market where it's like really really you know i'm trying to write a travel memoir yeah. or i'm trying to actually say i'm writing it but i'm trying to publish it right you yes, know yes how many times i went around and met with people who said well travel doesn't sell and i'm like well okay let's stop right there and say right. there's a whole channel exactly somebody, <laughs> somebody is somebody. interested yeah. In yeah. travel, travel. Maybe you yeah. can say the people who work for us don't know how to market the books. <laughs> exactly. But don't tell right. me travel doesn't sell when there's yeah. a whole channel, right? Exactly. Right. And then <laughs> it's like, well, okay, um, there isn't really an audience. No, let me just put it this way. And I asked this woman, this editor that I was meeting with, I said, tell me just off the top of your head, you know three of your favorite travel books. And she said, you know, she named three and it yeah. was all by white men. And I said, tell me three books by women. Yeah. She named, it took her a minute, but she named three women. I said, tell me three travel books by black people. Right. And we sat and we sat and we sat and we yeah. sat. Yeah. And she couldn't come up with any of them. Yeah. And I said, well, let me ask you this. Black people right now, if you look at the New York Times, you're looking at a lot of African writers writing about Africa. You're looking at a lot of like, you know, black American writers. Yeah. We are dominating so much of the literary bestsellers, right? Yeah. And then you look on Instagram and it ain't nothing but travel photos. And like I said, there's a whole channel. Yeah. Yeah. Is it somehow possible that you put the two together? <laughs> that there is actually a market for this? Right, right. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. is it really possible? And part of the issue is, you know, part of the issue is agency. It's like I'm traveling and doing things mm -hmm. that, you know, is within a white man's domain. It's like mm -hmm. people kind of have this bias that it's like a white man that goes and travels. I mean, it's it's even few, few white women who are allowed to publish yeah in that way, where it's yeah. a woman traveling on her own. And then here come me, little old black woman, yeah. 
you know, and yeah. so it's a real problem. And then I complicated things and decided, you know what, I'm traveling first class and I'm staying in five star hotels. And yeah. so every <laughs> single time I got into a line for an airplane, you know, in like yeah. the VIP line, somebody would come and say, you know that this is the uh, uh, <laughs> this is the first class line, <laughs> and you know what? I spent seven years during the time that I did this travel project. I spent seven years on airplanes, namely Emirates, saying to people, "I belong here. I'm right where I'm supposed to be." Right, right. But that's the title of the right. book. I belong <laughs> here, right. and no, that again. Up turns right back around with your coffee with a black man is how often do we have to keep saying I belong here yeah. Yeah. in the spaces in the spaces that we occupy yeah. Yeah. Right. and and sure. and what, what you just shared I mean that's what's at the root of the call for Black Lives Matter not the organization but the, the, the drumbeat for Black Lives Matter because what we just heard were multiple instances of devaluing Black lives, right? Mm -hmm. And and it happens and has been happening time and time again. And so, you know, when I when I say you know connect with the the gatekeepers, uh, you know, I I I guess I make the assumption because I I have a platform called Coffee with the Black Guy that there is this notion of unapologetically showing up as your black self, right? And so making sure that that's part of of, of, of what we do when we're connecting with gatekeepers. And, and when, you know, those of you who aren't Black and can't connect with that, making sure that you're, you're, you're sharing these stories, these connections that you're able to make, because what that ultimately does is it bridges that empathy gap. And that is what is going to get us through where we are right now. And so, um, you know, I, I leave that as, as at least one uh, takeaway. Um, another is I'll, I'll, I'll plug this because I know we talked about uh, um, you know so, uh, the artistic thing, and so I, I would be re uh, remiss if I didn't touch on an upcoming an event that we have coming on May sixth uh, with an, a local artist by the name of Tony Scott. Uh, she's an indigenous and African American woman uh, who's done research and has a lot of extensive research into her her family history and uses that to inform her art and and you know the pieces. Uh, the sculptures, the paintings, the um, uh, uh, multimedia uh, pieces that she she produces uh, are authentically uh, curating the experience, and 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 through a, a very uh, um, informed and um, gen genetically and, uh, and historically connected way, right? You know, it, it's it's root. That's where she gets her inspiration. Um, another thing I want to uh, uh, mention as a deliverable is, uh, is also, Jervy, I couldn't help but think about your idea of the Black Writers Retreat uh, in Santa Barbara area as I'm hearing this conversation, as I know what Santa Barbara can give, as I see, you know, the, 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 the great support of a, of a Chaucer's bookstore and all of our, 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 our sponsors and local folks who've, who've chimed in. I think that there's a real appetite for that. And, and uh, Nanama, we, I'll go ahead and put you on Front Street. It, we've been talking about finding ways to, to get her up here permanently. Are, is there a way to sustain uh, a, a, a cultural life in Santa Barbara uh, for, for Black folks? Yeah. And, and I would argue, yes, uh, uh, I, I've heard it personally, but uh, I think we've seen it demonstrated here today. I even um, have, and, a, and, I have a project uh, for this endo uh, endeavor, very quick one. Um, all right. Black okay. writers, black writers writing one page essays on the future of white people. Oh, that's, that's hilarious. That's scary. Uh, <laughs> but no, what I was going to say is, I think it could be done. Very what I was going to say is, writers, I would love to come to, I think that Santa Barbara is really on the cusp of something wonderful. And I personally would love to be there, but you know, sister needs a job. So <laughs> if, if, if anybody knows or anything, let me know. Just put it right on in here. But um, in the meantime, though, I do think that everything you're saying is true is what is the future of um, in, in cities, you know, in the cities in which we um, occupy, what is the future of that conversation, that dialogue, that imagining, the imagining of our Black selves, you know, um, and, and it's real and it's real in ways. And I think I shared with you, uh, James, that 
when I first moved out here, I went to every ice cream social with the police and I went to, you know, and I, I, I one time I went to an event with the um, Chamber of Commerce and there were a bunch of police officers and fire people and they were like, oh, hey, Danama, oh, hey, Danama. And the head of the Chamber of Commerce said, how do you know all of these police officers and stuff? And I said, well, you know what, when you are black <laughs> and you are living in a place like this, I take them donuts every Friday and I'm like, hey, don't kill me. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, the things that you think about are not the same things that anybody else thinks about, you know? And so for me, there's something to be said for having that police officer drive by, drive by my car, see that it's me and just wave and go, hey, Nanama. And so I, you know, but you have to put that extra effort in. And I would one day like to live somewhere where I kind of don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. My humanity is just assumed. And mm -hmm. so that's a great conversation you know, in future in terms of how do we, how do we um, create these spaces of, of understanding of blackness? How do we continue this conversation, mm -hmm. which obviously segues into what you're doing, James. So thank well, you that, so much. That, that, thank you. And, and the impetus of this, this Montecito Institute of, of Social Inquiry. Like when we were trying to think through what our goal or what, why we even decided to meet every week, we kind of came on this thing where you know, Santa Barbara is in a unique place to, you know, because we, because of, of what makes up our community, we're in a unique place to really be a model anti-racist community. What does that look like? How mm. does that look like in budgeting? How does that look like in a relationship with police? How does that look like when people come to this, to, to our area and don't have to put in the work, understanding that the work has already been done, right? And so, I, I think that there's a, a real opportunity for that. And, and without sounding too campaigny, that is exactly why I decided to, to throw my hat in the ring, you know, to run for mayor, because we have that opportunity. And, and, and I, I, you know, I, I agree with you. We're on the precipice of something uh, that can go either way. We're, we're at that fork in the road uh, on, on many levels. Um, and, and, and we can really uh, make us great in doing that. Good deal. Right. Well, this has been fruitful. I've loved it. But, you know, like, uh, 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 who was it? Uh, Carlton uh, he said, you, you got to go home or you can't got to go home or you ain't got to go home, but you can't stay here type That's thing. Right. That's We're right. on Zoom yeah. now. So right. <laughs> That's good. That's good. thank you indeed, so indeed. much for this. Thank you. Space. It's great. Um, not just tonight, but for the space that you're opening and for the spaces that you continue to open just with your presence and then with the dialogue and your willingness to sort of um, take on that heavy lifting and take on, I mean, it's not easy. I mean, um, just doing what you're doing and I applaud you and I appreciate it and I thank you for it. You'd be the first mayor I ever knew in Santa, Santa Barbara. I never who, knew who the mayor was ever. <laughs> now, Jeremy, you gotta stop with this like social networking thing about who, who's who and rubbing elbows with who, who. <laughs> and right. you know, you know a lot of people though anyway so you're lying yeah yeah Jer Jer jervy uh, is understated and very humble uh, at, uh most of the time <laughs> <That's it. laughs> well i, I should want to thank everybody uh 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 charles's red canary Connect collective uh uh james joe uh 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 casey everybody for for having us it's been uh it's been a blast yeah we'll do it again yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, we we're already talking to have been been conversating about uh, uh, part two, uh, so we're right going to be looking forward to that. Until then, everyone, stay safe. Thank you. Make yeah. sure you Thank get you vaccinated. Safe, All right, we'll talk to you soon. All okay. right. All right. Bye bye. 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 Okay.